Welcome, everyone. Uh, this is uh, going to be a fun and exciting uh, topic for sure, uh, titled Successfully Managing Your Freelance Workforce. We're sponsored by Stoke. You'll get to learn a lot more about them, a Fiverr company, as we go through the next hour or so. Um, remember, as Kat mentioned, the audio um, capabilities and your ability to ask questions. Please ask questions throughout. I will keep an eye on those and either plug those in when it makes sense or keep them till the end. And if we don't get to your question, we'll respond to them after the fact. For those of you that don't know SIA, uh, we have so many offerings to the uh, uh, larger ecosystem. We have products for suppliers slash providers uh, and then also buyers. Uh, I support buyer organizations. We call them our beloved council members and, uh, and help them with their uh, strategies and thought leadership around contingent labor and even total talent management. Uh, we have wonderful events. Uh, I, at the end of the deck, I will uh, share some dates with you, uh, but most of you, I suspect, have either been to or have considered going to one of our lovely conferences. They tend to be fantastically well attended. Uh, we just came off of our executive forum in Miami last week, and it was awesome. Our editorial, there's free services out there for you. You can uh, subscribe to uh, the Daily News 3.0 and Staffing Industry Review, and I and for those of you that are CCWP certified attending this webinar, you get one credit. And if you need to know more about our industry leading certification, please reach out to us. Um, we have an amazing amount of people that have gone through this and, uh, and continue to, to stay engaged. This is a little bit of the uh, partial list of our buyer organizations that we support. We're just Every time I see this, I just um, am so grateful for the partnerships that we have with these amazing companies and, uh, and the direction and the learning that we, we kind of do together is just incredible. Um, so thank you if you're a council member. If you'd like to learn more about that, you can contact us uh, for more information as well. Today I'm joined uh, by uh, two speakers, Shahar Urez, he's the co-founder and CEO for Stoke and Fiverr, and Shahar Tepair, who's the Global Procurement Director for Amdocs. And you know me, we've already been introduced. So without further ado, let's get into some research. So I've got a few slides here uh, that uh, some of you uh, may not have seen this or, or, or thought about what's happening with the independent worker business and, and the individuals that uh, are trying to become independents or are independents. And if we look at the beginning of the pandemic, to what happened, there's been a huge swell of independent contractors that are in the marketplace. Lots of reasons why, potentially. Um, we'll talk about some of those as we kind of go through the next slides. We also have proof that being an independent contractor, uh, people are happier. Um, in, in the older generation, the baby boomers, it was very common for people to stay with an organization for two decades, three decades, four decades. And what we're seeing is, is a huge shift, especially in the younger generations. And Shahar, I know you've got some slides on that that tell us a story of that transformation that's happening. And so generally speaking, this is by the way, a source from our friends at MBO uh, and their um, annual independence survey. Uh, it's, it's pretty awesome. It's a free, free survey if you wanna get your hands on that, but they are generally happier. And then lastly, we're seeing incredible growth with platform technologies um, to the tune of $21 billion. And it's outpacing traditional temporary staffing by a lot, uh, 5X to be exact. And so these last three slides tell us a few things. One, this market is growing uh, for freelancers, independent contractors around the globe. Two, um, the, the talent loves working in that environment. And three, um, I think buyer organizations, and that's part of the story you you will hear today, is how do buyers start to leverage this opportunity. Without further ado, um, Shahar, why don't you take us through uh, Stoke and a little bit about your company. So thanks, Frank. Uh, always glad to collaborate with SIA. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Uh, my name is Shahar. I uh, founded Stoke Talent uh, a little over four years ago uh, with my co-founder, and we founded the company after about a year of research when we came to realize that uh, we're um, just before um, a significant shift in the industry where the market's going to be uh, filled with a lot more freelancers than what we got used to over the last two decades. And as we explored different avenues to how companies will cope with that, we started realizing that 
um, there is a need for a significant shift in a platform that will allow to streamline the various uh, organizational processes that are currently dealing with um, freelancers, contractor, contingent workforce, generally speaking, and to simplify the entire process to reduce um, all the risks um, and automate as much of the process as possible. And with that, we created Stoke Talent that kind of streamlines the process. We're not going to go into the product itself today, but that kind of what led us into, into doing this. But I'd like to cover today, by the way, Shahar, fun fact, trivia fact for the, for the audience, that slide that had the gold dot in it when SIA um, first became an entity some 30 years ago, that was the only thing we focused on was staffing. And over the next three decades, you can see, and by the way, we update, we look and update this on a regular basis. This is a new iteration uh, because the ecosystem keeps growing and changing. And hence the, the reason why Stoke and, and, uh, and Amdocs are here today is, is to tell their story of, around that, specifically to um, the freelancer uh, independent contractor workforce. That's, that's a great story. Um, and, and it is interesting because as you think about it, one of the things I'm going to cover um, is talk about these, what I call the five forces are currently um, impacting the workforce. What we used to call three, four years ago the future of work. Now, kind of realize that future came faster than we planned. Um, we're going to talk a bit about what can you um, as leaders in your organization do about it. Um, and then I'm going to hand it over uh, to my colleague, uh, Shahar, to, to tell the story about how, how MDOCs approach this challenge. And then obviously, uh, we'll leave enough room uh, and time for Q&A. So we kind of live in an era where we're hitting a perfect storm that uh, will completely change how work gets done within organization. There are five key reasons that are driving it, two within organization, and three that are impacting the workforce itself. Number one, organizations are under um, immense pressure um, to adapt quicker than ever. The pace of change in which organizations are facing um, is unprecedented and it's going to only accelerate. By the way, there's a, there's a great book about it uh, called Thank You for Being Late by uh, Thomas Friedman. If you haven't read about it, it, calls about, it talks to um, um, adaptation in, in the pace of change or something along that line. Read it, uh, uh, highly recommend it. But the reality is if you think about it, we, we think a lot about changes in technology, which is true moving from you know, client-server application to web application to SaaS to machine learning to AI to uh, generative AI, just the pace of change technology is indeed fast. But it's not only that. Companies are under immense pressure to deal with change in go-to-market, marketing uh, methods and platforms change, new verticals are emerging, new uh, regions you want to uh, penetrate are, are, are changing as well, not to mention um, macroeconomics that demand a lot of flexibility within the, organ within the organization. So change is immense, and in, in existing organizational structures are not well designed to cope with never-ending change. Um, and what you face is that when you have a need for changing market, changing skills, you find yourself in skills shortage. And the skills that are currently existing within organization are not the skills that that organization will need in two years, are not the skills that they needed four years ago. And so when there's a need for new skills, the organization feels in shortage and need to quickly adapt, onboard this type of new skill into the organization. Add to that the fact that um, this um, we live in an era where people don't stick to the same company for more than an average of four years and technology is under two years. And so companies need to constantly find ways to adapt. To go to the other side of the equation within the talent marketplace, um, we're seeing a generational shift. Millennials, Gen Z are, are getting to the point where they, they are the majority of the workforce. Um, just to orient, millennials, if I remember correctly, are kind of 1980, early 80 to 95. Um, Gen Zs are 95 to 2010, some would say to, uh, 2015. But that's kind of just to orient yourselves around that, that era. And that generation has a completely different expectation uh, and are looking for a different social construct. They're not looking for a single employer. They'll actually avoid it as much as they can. Um, they don't want to deal with the corporate, um, excuse me, BS of pay bans, performance reviews. They want to stay away from that methodology. Um, there was a survey done with Gen Zs in 2018, pre-pandemic, um, that said uh, where 45% of uh, um, high schoolers in the United States said they will never take a steady job. Uh, some of them will regret it. 
But uh, there was a survey uh, that was done, I think, a week or two ago by Business Insider, where uh, apparently 67% of Gen Zs are already practicing freelance, as an example. So we are seeing this shift happening. They want a different social construct. Add to that another fact. Um, this, these generations have seen their parents go through four economic crises in two decades, lose their jobs. They don't have any sense of job security, and they're not looking for it. They want to move around. They want to have that flexibility. They want to be their own boss. Remote work, we all have this tendency to think remote work started uh, um, when the pandemic started. By the way, my daughter just told me today that um, today or yesterday, there was a, somewhere they marked that uh, three years to the day when since the pandemic started hitting us. Uh, I didn't realize it, but that's a fact now. Um, but the fact is remote work started way before. Uh, already in 2018, there were 3,000 companies in the United States alone that had no offices at all. Um, what the pandemic did is accelerated things that we expected uh, to happen earlier. But this generation can work remotely. They're moving around. Uh, digital nomads is not, not a new term. We're seeing more and more people work from anywhere, and work can be done from anywhere. Um, technology advancements make it very easy. WebEx, Zoom, uh, Slack, uh, Asynchronous. Uh, communication, so you can work, do any work from any, well, not any work, almost any work from anywhere uh, and still get by. And last but not least, uh, it's never been easier to pick up a new skill. Uh, universities, three years learning, four years learning are still relevant to those who are expecting it, but if you want to be good at coding, designing, content writing, pick up a, uh, um, a course on Coursera, Masterclass, Udemy, uh, Pluralsci, uh, Stack Overflow, and you can be great and become super relevant to provide services to any company out there. And so all these forces together are completely shifting to how organizations need to treat uh, their future uh, work. Now, this isn't new, it isn't, didn't start now already. Uh, Deloitte's Human Capital Trend Report, by the way, their, their new report came out uh, in January, probably six weeks ago. I highly recommend uh, uh, for everybody to read it. But already in 2019, they said the alternative workforce is now mainstream. And they, they, there's an entire section that speaks to how organizations need to start adapting to the world where alternative work, alternative employees, referring to freelancers, contractor, and the fact that organizations need to look at this motion strategically. This isn't just let's you know use some band-aids with freelancers. No, look strategically at that motion because that is becoming majority of the workforce. Um, um, about two months ago, Josh Burson, uh, who's a, a very well-known influencer uh, in the HR tech space, um, wrote an article that said, you know, growth in hybrid contract and gig work is astronomical. Um, in some cases, we're seeing 40 to 60 percent of workers on contract. I have to say this is high on the extreme to what we're seeing. We're seeing an average of 15 to 20 on average. There are extreme cases where we're seeing, uh, you know, over 50 percent. Really depends on the type of company, uh, um, how early they are, startups versus corporates. There, there's differences, uh, but doesn't matter if it's really 40 percent or 35 percent. It is a huge number and a huge portion of that works. I don't know, Frank, if, if, what you guys are seeing at SIA when it comes to percentages. Yeah, it's in alignment. That's exactly right. Um, our buyer survey uh, has us at about 22 percent across all industries, but we are seeing, uh, depending on the, the organizational type um, and, and their culture, um, big numbers. And uh, there's some search engines that have publicly announced that they're at 50% uh, are, are, contract, are in contract. So, yeah, yep. exactly. Um, so a, a bit of understanding of what these numbers really mean. One of the things that we ask um, um, companies uh, is, which skills, how far do you think are, is the need to reskill within your organization? And almost 50% are saying we need reskilling now. The type of skills that we need to stay relevant in the market don't exist within the organization. 50% of companies feel it's now the time and do not have the ability to go and hire full-time employees into these roles. And so the need to change is now within these organizations. We spoke about uh, Gen Zs and Millennials and how much of the workforce they're making. We're pretty close to that point where they're going to cross the 50% Millennials and Gen Z. And we're about five to six years where they're going to be the workforce. We're going to, I don't know how old everybody is on the call, but most of us are going to be, you know, on the outliers of the workforce. Most of them are going to be Millennials and, G, and Gen Z that have a complete different expectation to how they want to work, how they want to work, perform. 
and organizations that don't start preparing themselves are going to find themselves challenged. Now, just to understand, um, the numbers are back. It's very difficult to really understand exactly what are the numbers of freelancers in the world because um, in, in, um, every country measures it differently and there's not a clear way to measure it. The data is pretty scarce. Um, but if we take you know, one uh, gigantic regulated body that, that does that, the IRS uh, has published a survey, or sorry, a research that says by 2030, we're going to hit 60% of the workforce um, involved in the freelance economy. We can see how this growth is going to grow um, over the next few years. It's not that's just the United States, by the way. We're seeing the same numbers in Italy. Um, in the Netherlands, uh, over the last decades, the number of freelancers has grown 100%. Spain, very similar numbers to Italy. So this isn't just the United States thing. If you look at Asia Pacific, um, it's, there's a gigantic number of freelancers there for a lot of obvious reasons. They give services um, to a lot of Western countries. So this uh, um, um, store material tsunami is taking over um, the entire landscape. I'd like to pause here for a second, kind of ask the audience, uh, if you don't mind, we'll, we'll have the poll come up and ask you, how many freelancers or independent contractors currently do you employ in your company? Um, and again, Frank, I don't know if you have any um, kind of sense to what is that number. Yeah, it's a, it, this will be fun to see what the responses are. We have conversations with enterprise buyers like Amdocs um, on a daily basis, and this question can be difficult for them to answer. What I typically hear is, yeah, we know we have them, but we don't know what to do with them. We can't see them. Um, we might have scenarios where a manager is using their um, corporate credit card, a P card, outside of the realm of approvals and finance. So it just kind of gets put in as an expense. Um, so this this will be interesting to see what they come back with. This is uh, somewhat of a loaded question. Hopefully everybody can participate. And by the way, it's completely anon anonymous. We don't know who's responding to what, and then make sure you keep your questions coming in. Thank you. Um, can we pull up the results? I have no idea how to do that. Um, so if I can see them. Um, you should see them on the, on the right-hand side of your screen. Yeah, so it looks like. Oh, there we go, yeah. Yeah, the majority had no answer, which tells us a lot. Yeah. I kind of think no answer is, I don't know. Um, yeah. With, yeah, small percentages, uh, 51 to 10, 101 to 250, it's pretty spread out. Yeah, uh, and so I'll tell you, uh, one of the things that we're seeing, um, which is very, uh, it's similar to what we're seeing here. Um, in 90% of cases, when we talk to uh, companies, um, they have no idea how many freelancers, contractors they have. And the reason is it's spread out across the organization. Uh, there's no one really that's responsible on this part of the workforce. It's split between HR, procurement, the specific hiring managers, legal, finance, accounting, IT. So it's, no one really feels like I own the freelancers in the organization. When we do get a number, by the way, it's usually um, three to five X the real number. They have no idea how many they have. They underestimate the number. And um, when we start digging in, uh, when you know, we hear a number, oh, we have two or three. You know, what about your designers? Oh, you know, maybe we have those as well. What about some uh, marketing? Oh, we have some consultants. All of a sudden, you know, the numbers start adding up and you realize that this part of the workforce is completely unmanaged um, for a lot of good reasons. It's complicated to manage it. No one wants to hold this hot potato within the organization because it comes with uh, risks and compliance issues. Like, you know, uh, so there's a lot of pushback. Um, so what can you do about it, really, specifically, um, you know, procurement leaders such as yourself within your organization? There's really two options. One, you can ignore it. Not my problem, not my hot potato. I'll just let it slide. Number two is really embrace this change. Um, should you decide to ignore it, the reality is that you're going to go to a place where business velocity slows down. It's going to slow down because, um, A, it takes a lot of time to hire. B, you're not going to be able to pick up the skills that you need. Um, the talent pool will shrink because all of a sudden more people don't want to be full-time employees of your company. They want to be freelancers. Then you're going to run into issues because this is an unmanaged territory, running into risks like workforce misclassification, which we can go into specifically in, in specific countries uh, or states, California, New Jersey, 
uh, Massachusetts, if you're in the U.S. where it's, it's worse than any other state right now, you're going to run into tax uh, risks uh, in 1099 submission, 1042S is for global countries, IR35 in the U.K. So compliance is a risk you're going to run because this is going to be unmanaged part of your business. And then, of course, legal compliance, who owns IP, um, how do I protect my data, am I complying with GDPR, am I complying with CCPA? So all of this is going to be something that a, um, just like, you know, nobody wants to fall on a tax audit, you're going to hope that no one's going to find out that this is unmanaged or that if you fall under an audit, they'll find out that you have no idea how many freelancers you have in your organization and they are unmanaged. Should you decide to embrace it, um, over time, very quickly, your organization will start developing this muscle of agility. I need skills, I need resources, I can grow, and I know how to grab that type of resources. Um, through a global pool of talent that's now available to me. They're freelancers. I can onboard them for a project, you know, sometimes a few weeks, sometimes a few months. Um, once you start managing, all of a sudden you will be able to significantly reduce the risks of workforce misclassification and legal compliance because so you're going to be able to track legal documents. Um, and more than anything else, you're going to have everything visible and controlled. I'll give you a short um, um, I don't know, an equivalent to how I got to this realization. About 15 years ago, um, I was fortunate to work at a company that was pioneering cloud computing, a company called VMware. And um, one of the things that we saw there as cloud computing started emerging was most IT organizations uh, were opposed to using public cloud because it's not within our control. It's like we rather work with the processes through procurement, go and buy a computer, go and wait three weeks for the computer to arrive, work through all that processes. Now, all of a sudden, when uh, cloud computing emerged and everybody can buy their own uh, you know, cloud resources according to compliance, obviously, all of a sudden the businesses started moving a lot faster. Now, while IT was objecting, the business itself started buying cloud services without going through procurement or through IT. And the there, there was this initiation of the term shadow IT. We run our own IT, the business said, because we cannot wait for IT to support the business. So we're going to do our own thing. And it took IT six to seven years to kind of figure out they either they take control over cloud and enable this agility, or they will be the ones that are going to be pushed out of the organization. And I think we are at a point where if freelancers are going to be the majority of the workforce, you either manage it or you're going to get in a point where you're going to have a shadow HR. And shadow HR means you're going to have people conducting work for the organization, but you have no control over who they are, where they are, what they're doing, are they complying. Um, so obviously, I encourage you to embrace the change. And with that, um, uh, it is a pleasure to invite um, a colleague, um, not just a customer, but a colleague and a partner that has pushed us uh, into building the platform, Shaha Tepper. Uh, head of Procurement at Amdocs, which is a global company, which I'm sure most of you know. Um, Shahar, uh, all yours. So nice to meet you all. Uh, so my name is Shahar Tepper. I'm leading the business uh, domain uh, at Amdocs from Procurement Department. For those who are not familiar with Amdocs, so Amdocs is a multinational software and service provider that specializes in uh, providing solutions for the telecommunication industry. Uh, this includes solutions for customers' uh, experience management, revenue management, network management, and digital transformation. Uh, our yearly revenue is uh, $4.2 billion. Um, the workforce uh, is 26,000 employees, which are spread across uh, 85 different company, uh, countries. And our uh, customer portfolio is more than 350 uh, customers. Of course, uh, all of them are spread globally. Uh, so, what is Amdux Workforce uh, portfolio? Uh, I would like to split it into three uh, main pillars. Uh, so, the first pillar is the Amdux full-time employees. Uh, I believe that you're all familiar with it. Is. And then there is the contingent workforce, uh, which are the contractors. We are contractors for short-term and for long-term. Some of them are for, for uh, uh, technology, with the technology uh, uh, skills. Some of them are not technology. And the third one is the M&A, Merge and Acquisition. So over the past uh, couple of years, Amdox acquired between five to six companies uh, uh, on a yearly basis. And these M&As basically allow Amdox to evolve rapidly in terms of technology, 
but also expose our corporate to a new workforce population, which these are the freelancers. The freelancers' populations with uh, this type of new populations, it brings a lot of new challenges since they, they didn't fit to our traditional pillars that we were used to. Uh, the challenges that this population brought to, our, to, to this corporate was uh, individual life cycles of each one of the freelancers, Okay, labor compliance. We were not familiar with what are the compliance that uh, those freelancers need to be and exposed, and, and there's a potential exposure for to our company. Um, all the transactions we as uh, as a corporate we would like to make like payment terms. We have uh, specific payment terms. We have we are making large transactions, and this population basically were the opposite of, of, of how we used to uh, uh, perform. Um, and of course, each freelancer is a, a, an individual a contributor, and, and it's required to establish this new personality uh, as a new vendor within our system. I believe that uh, you as procurement guys, you're, from, you're totally familiar how, how time-consuming it is to establish a new vendor within the system and, and running through the entire process. As, as you saw, we, are, we have presence in 85 different companies, so to establish them each freelancer and the, the, end, the relevant entity, it will, it will be uh, time consuming. And of course, it didn't suit the company DNA that we were used to. So I understood that we need to find an holistic solution and uh, to support this population because the freelancer is here to stay. And more and more acquisitions that we, uh, that we perform, it requires more, uh, uh, it requires more, uh, uh, it, um, brings more and more challenges. So, and now what? Uh, so then I start, uh, I start the research and, uh, it, and identify what are the mandatory criteria that I would like uh, that the solution that I brought and that will bring to my organization will, will be complied to. So first of all, I wanted to have a standalone solution. The reason for that as a, uh, as a corporate, there are many stakeholders that as, uh, since you would like to introduce a new solution to the organization, there are many, many stakeholders like information security, GDPR, legal, there are many, many stakeholders that you need to take the, you need to uh, get the approval before you even introduce the, the new solution. So I wanted to keep it simple as much as I could, have a standalone solution. Uh, I wanted to have a multinational uh, coverage, as, as you know, as, uh, again, we are spread uh, globally. One of the major uh, uh, criteria that, uh, that I need uh, this uh, tool to be uh, is, is labor compliance, to fulfill all the labor compliance and of course to perform all the relevant background checks in order to reduce the risk of, of the organization in terms of labor and employment and of course all the legal uh, um, issues that may come up with uh, as soon as you hire a, a freelancer. I wanted this solution to be a friendly user uh, since uh, it will increase the adoption of the of the end users within my organization, and I already identified what is the the potential in, uh, that I can gain from this situation and and create a new talent pool to my organization, reduce the time to hire, and of course be more agile and bring you know a disruptive idea, a new idea to the organization and uh, uh, as as part of the solution. And more than that, as Shahal mentioned, a trusted partner with the ability to influence on the solution itself. Uh, so that was the, the main criteria that I, I, uh, I, I, I identified. As part of it, when I, as soon as I, I, uh, I uh, met, uh, uh, I ran an RFP, first of all, an RFI, sorry, uh, first of all, uh, to collect all the information and, 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 and to identify who are the relevant uh, solutions within the market. Afterwards, I ran an RFP for that. But I can tell you from, from the beginning, uh, there was a, a click with stock talent uh, in an instant. And I can tell you that the process, end-to-end -end process from the RFP to go live took, took me three months and the system was up and running. So uh, immediately just assign a dedicated account manager to make it like a smooth, uh, a massive upload of the of the freelancers population, and I can tell you that at this stage, Stock Talent managed for Andox more than 100 freelancers, 
uh, which the majority of the freelancers are based in the US, Canada, and also across the globe, with a monthly spend over $1 million. Uh, as, part of, as part of the, <clears throat> as part of the, before even I can tell you, as part of, of the solution and, the, and to identify what is the relevant solution, I, I procurement, I was the, the pivot to make that uh, um, journey or, or to make the, the implementation of the two, um, uh, uh, the internal, the, on top of the criteria that I, I found myself that I need to take care of, I, I also did a, a, a journey, uh, an internal discovery within my organization. Myself, as, as a procurement, I, I needed to involve many departments, different departments within my organization. First of all was the, the legal and, and compliance department, which I needed to explore with them. What is this new freelancers populations? What, their, what uh, type of risk they might come up with uh, and, and how to overcome this, uh, uh, this uh, to mitigate those risks. As well, finance and account payable to hear from them what are the, the major challenges that they see in terms of, of engaging those freelancers. The insurance department, that was another department that I, that I engaged in order to, uh, to evaluate what type of insurance I need to, uh, 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 to enforce each one of the freelancers uh, for them to, uh, to add, as well tax, and to explore with HR what are the type, this new type of, of, of workforce that will be joined to our organization. So uh, procurement within my organization, the position of the, pro, uh, the position of the procurement within my organization allow me to make the decisions and overcome all these challenges to make, uh, to make uh, the implementation of this tool very rapidly. Um, so quick, I have a question. How hard was this? How, how difficult was it to gain um, these departments' approval? If you will. Mm -hmm. So um, the reason, uh, so they say the catalyst, the catalyzator for uh, for the uh, for freelancers is the basically it's here to stay. You know, because of the M and A that we acquired, those freelancers were uh, part of our ecosystem. So the only thing it was it was for me to uh, to tell them, guys, it's here to stay. Now we need to deal it. And we need to handle it, uh, you know, understand what are the exposures that we are facing, understand what is the benefit that those freelancers are bringing to our organization and how quick we can embrace this new population to our organization and minimum risk and, 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 and remove all the obstacles within the, uh, within the process. So um, uh, again, procurement myself, Made it happen and uh, convinced each one of the each one of the departments that this is the right thing to do. Of course, that was a part of the discovery, and afterwards I approach uh, and and run the RFP and the RFI based on their recommendation. Okay. Yeah. Well, and I think what reading between the lines, you had to you had to take full responsibility. If this didn't go well, it was going to be on no. you. Yeah. So following uh, what Chaho mentioned earlier, this hot hot potato that was on the table, uh, I like I like hot potatoes. All right, uh, I like to jump on those and and then just bring the solution to my organization and bring the value to uh, to the organization since I saw the benefit of having this uh, of of hiring this uh, pool of talent and what this pool of talent the freelancers can, can provide to my organization. And on top of that, I can tell you uh, the, the contingent workforce is being managed by procurement. It means the contractors uh, for short term, for long term. And we have, of course, the SOW, scope of work that are performed by third parties. And the, the freelancers, for me, it's an additional pillar to fulfill the, the, the company needs uh, and the velocity and provider in terms of the velocity and the needs, the, the, the instance and uh, to fulfill the needs of the company as, as, as fast as I can. So for me, it was a great opportunity, you know, to, to be exposed to this uh, new uh, pool talent. Uh, Fantastic. Uh, 
Right. So what my organization and myself, of course, we earn from 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 the entire process. So uh, we are now fully compliant in terms of of labor, of tax, insurance, legal. All those aspects have been removed from the table. Right? It means that I can now hire when there is a freelancer, whatever is located in the world, I can hire. I can I can onboard in very rapidly with a seamless process. Okay, I have, I have contract management. I, I know on, on within a click of a button what is the type of engagement that I have with each one of the freelancers. For, for procurement, you know how we like to be on top of things and, and, and evaluate what is the budget versus the actual spend that we, are, that we, that, uh, that we consume. So it allows us uh, to know on the spot uh, and manage our budget uh, more smoothly and rapidly. It brings to the organization self-service. It means that each one of the of Amber's employee can engage the platform, look for a talent, and he can onboard it as soon as he gets the, the approval, the budget approved. He can onboard these specific uh, uh, these, these specific resources in in, in very rapidly. Uh, so this is this is a huge advantage, and of course. Have everything, and each one of the resource manager in the business unit have full visibility about the about the workforce that he's managed. He can he manage the the full time employees, the contractors, and now the freelancers. Yeah, um, and I I like the title of that uh, with intent and purpose it is earned, because that this is your ROI, right? This is the return on the investment that you're making. Um, checking these boxes is really incredible. And, and of course the usage, you can see the adoption of the tool and adoption of these talent pool very rapidly. So uh, this is a very ad, a good advantage that we earned as well. Yeah. Um, so uh, for me as, as, a, as, as a manager, as a procurement from the procurement department, I knew that the solution suit to uh, you know to the company to the organization needs, but it was more impressive to see what is the feedback from the end user, okay? That work day on on daily basis on on the system itself. So here you can find some quotes for our from from the stakeholders, and you know the feedback is was it was across the across the organization. So. So what are the, ta the key takeaways from, from the entire process? Okay, so in large enterprise organizations, so one is keep it, keep it simple, all right? We, uh, and have a standalone tool. Uh, Stoke is a, is a SaaS solution, uh, zero APIs. I wanted to keep it simple. I wanted to have it standalone, very rapid go live. And, uh, and, you know, to make like, this is the fact, the, the stock, stock talent is here in, in, the, in Amdox organization and it's here to stay. And, uh, of course, to be compliant, involved, legal compliance at early stages, these are the major uh, concerns and, and reduce the risk to understand what are the risk of hiring freelancers from the beginning for you to select the right tool that will be uh, reduce to the minimum the risk of hiring contingent workforce and freelancers specifically. All right, identify the early adapters. All right, uh, you need to uh, um, who will adopt the product, the pro uh, the system as soon as possible, and start only with one department. I can tell you we have more than uh, uh, we have substantial quant uh, numbers of of departments within my organization, so I, I prefer to work only with one department at the beginning to see that it works to run a POC. It went very, very smoothly. And of course, the adoption afterwards, it was seamless. And uh, uh, when you identified who is the relevant department that you would like to engage, the early adopters, then to choose, uh, uh, to choose a dedicated owner, a champion within that organization who knows all the ins and outs within the organization, who knows the politics, who can who can speed up and run up you know the entire process and upload the, those freelancers to the platform, and of course data is the king. Prepare all the data ahead of time. Try to uh, remove all this shadow hiring or all these type of 
of, of engagement that you're familiar, try to collect as much as you can to do a massive upload to the system. And the, the, the last uh, takeaway is to build a proper procurement flow, uh, workflow that as soon as you will scale up, this is what happened within my organization, everything will be fit and, and, and you will be able to train and duplicate the, uh, the process and, and it will create a seamless adoption of, of additional business units within your organization. So the journey with Stock Talent, it was, uh, just to, to summarize, it was, for me, it was a really great uh, uh, journey uh, from the exploration to bring the, the, to my organization the right solution with zero time, uh, and it improved our visibility and, and increased our talent pool very, uh, in, in, in very high scale. So it's, uh, it's a great adventure. And, uh, and so a question to you, um, if, I'm, if I'm a manager, uh, what are my, sourcing, talent, my talent sourcing channels available to me? So full time, you kind of went through those, but I, wanna, I want the audience to kind of understand how this fits in and maybe how that gets accessed. So uh, in Antox organization, we have, uh, there are two different, there is talent acquisition, who is in charge for all the full time employees. And there's the contingent workforce. The contingent workforce, as I mentioned, they're responsible for all the uh, contractors for long-term, short-term that we hire them through third parties, vendors, and SOW, all the scope of work, the technology, as the scope of work that we, we acquired from third party as well. And now we aggregated these additional talent pool, which is, are the freelancers. But all those three uh, different uh, uh, workflows uh, are being managed and by, by procurement. Fantastic. And we got a question. So when you say standalone solution, do you mean this solution stands outside of the MSP VMS program? Or is it integrated within that? This is a standalone. It's outside of the MSP, outside of the VMS, but we still have a full visibility on what's going on within the, uh, uh, what is being managed by the MSP and what is managed by, uh, uh, by Stoke. And the, and the business unit and myself, as well as procurement, have a full visibility what is the total uh, workforce that I'm managing. How are you doing that? How do you, uh, what's the visibility? We have, a platform. we have tools, of course, that combine all those. Uh, we pull the, the data from different sources and based on that, we create uh, the entire, uh, uh, the holistic view of the world. So you use a business intelligence type exactly. of dashboard. Yeah, yeah. very cool. On the, yeah. Another question, did you find some departments are bigger users um, of the tool versus others, wondering which ones are most entrusted in a uh, freelance management system. Uh, it's due to the diversity of services that Amdox is, is providing to the market, right? There are, um, there are let's say, uh, um, uh, business units who need engagement of services for a short period of time. For specific, for an example, we have a company who provides subtitles to uh, to Netflix, I believe that you're familiar with uh, uh, with Netflix, the majority of, uh, of the audience over here. So yeah. some of the subtitles that you see over there are being provided by one of the departments within uh, within um, So within that um, that department, he, he basically needs to engage uh, uh, for a really short period of time. Uh, uh, a worker that will translate or aggregate the subtitles to a certain movie. This task can take one day, two days, three days, and depends on, the, on, the, on how long the movie is, all right? So for those type of transactions, this is the, 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 the most suitable uh, um, workforce that is required. These are freelancers. I need a translator. I need a subtitle who is based in Germany to perform uh, this subtitles for this specific movie. As soon as it will finish, that's it. I'm going to pay the amount that we agreed upon and, and release it. And if there's going to be an additional release, so, so 
These are the type of engagements. Some of the engagements are like this, all right? So you can imagine how many movies Netflix are performing, so you can understand the scale, all right? But there are some other projects which are for long-term, but we need them a specific and a unique or a niche skill uh, that those niche skills, you can probably we will find them as freelancers since they are jumping from one uh, uh, company to another, absorbed a lot of, of knowledge from different companies. And based on that, they bring this knowledge to my organization and allow Amdocs to perform, you know, better and fulfill the task that is in, uh, within our hands. And we try to, let's say, give them the, the flexibility still of the freelancer to to work in some other companies, but still provide uh, the services to Amdocs. And this is what the freelancer, by the way, he likes. Sure. Yeah, that's awesome. Question I'll, for... try to, I'll try to give uh, kind of uh, what we're seeing in the market, um, obviously not specifically to Amdocs, but across companies that we're seeing. Um, there are more, there are teams, departments that are more um, uh, leaning towards freelancing. It's part of their DNA. Um, where digital services um, is a significant need is where adoption is the easiest. Um, you'd see that with marketing organizations where they're working with a lot of content writers, graphic designers, video editors, uh, influencers. So a lot, a lot of that type of services are coming within marketing. But it's starting to expand beyond that. We're seeing it in HR where you need recruiters to scale up and down specific areas. Um, employer branding uh, operations, obviously in engineering where you need skills. Um, and we're seeing more and more where the organization is realizing how much you can do with this on-demand workforce. Data collection, researches, analysis, uh, um, slide deck design. So there's a lot of new areas where we're seeing once a company starts adopting that approach, it goes beyond. Uh, but definitely marketing and engineering are, are the ones leading the, those part of the business. Got a question for you, Shahar and Stoke. Um, does this... Does this mean that the Stoke uh, solution consolidates freelancers from other platforms, i.e., maybe an Upwork or a Toptel? Is that part yeah. of your solution? So what we're seeing uh, in most cases is that companies that start working with Stoke either migrate their talent uh, into Stoke. Stoke has built-in marketplace capabilities as well, so you can source freelancers through Stoke as well. We don't have our own uh, um, marketplace, if you will, with an ecosystem of partners. Uh, we're not trying to onboard talents. When we bring in talent, uh, we bring only vetted talent. And so, uh, generally speaking, most customers eventually uh, consolidate everything uh, through SOAP. Interesting. Very good. Hopefully that answers your question, Alan. Another question. Um, this is, uh, do you allow your managers to access um, these uh, platforms directly to place orders? That's for you. Car. Yeah, so as, as I mentioned, we built, uh, we built the procurement workflow that basically as soon as you get the budget approval and you know exactly what it was the, the budget that was allocated for, a, it may be one resource, five resources, whatever, all right, it, it gives you freedom for you to log in, to look by yourself. This is one of the key, key criteria that I I, for the for the tool selection, that it will be self-service. You have the budget. Uh, do the uh, look for the talent within within the stock platform. Do the interview by yourself. All right. If you find a candidate, onboard him. All right. Through the process, you know he will have to sign the NDA with Amdocs, security, all that kind of of, of things. But you have a self-service. And yeah. the adoption. I think I think this is key, just because um, Shahar is making a good point. And, and, and again, Amdocs, when we started working, um, to be honest, I was doubtful, knowing the company and its scale, how how lean they will treat the process. Because most large organizations have um, high levels of bureaucracy when it comes to these types of things. Uh, but I think Amdocs quickly realized that as the world's changing, this needs to be self-serve. I'll go back to my cloud analogy from earlier. Um, no one here today um, asks. Um, each software developer to go open a PO before they spin up a new machine on Amazon. Today, it looks ridiculous. But if you go back 15 years ago, no one would use a server without going through a PO process. And so some of what Chahar is talking about is really that uh, bringing in a, a platform 
um, Stoke or, or others, right? It doesn't matter right now which tool you're using, but one that empowers the hiring managers, if they have the budget to go find the, 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 the freelancers themselves, um, have the entire process in the background, onboard the freelancers, get them to sign the legal documents, all of that without having the hiring manager go chase accounting to make sure they collect the W-9 and legal to get the legal template, just have it as self-serve as possible because otherwise it becomes very, very difficult to adopt freelancers because you ask the hiring managers at the front line to do more legwork in order to help work with freelancers. Uh, so of that, it's created a lot of let's say, engagement between the hiring manager because he made, he made that decision by himself. He is in charge for the budget and he will not waste it. All right. So, so that's he, the he question about rogue is, spend. So um, how, how do you know that it's not this wild, wild west uh, using people they don't need? You kind of mentioned they have a budget, but how does that tie into the financial system so you know that somebody has approval to do this? So, so go ahead, Chuck. <laughs> no, first of all, yeah, please go. Yeah. Uh, basically, again, the system um, has, you know, its own chain of approvals as required. Uh, you can make a decision whether you want to approve budget or you want to approve every time a payment goes out. You can decide what is the approval chain, who needs to approve every time something happens in the system. It's a requirement. It's a make sense requirement. Uh, but again, we take a, a page out of the cloud book, um, and if someone spins up a machine on Amazon and spend two thousand dollars that they should have, you can all stop it the next day, and, and that's part of the of this empowerment process. And to Shahal's point, once you give people budget, and that budget is visible and controlled, people show more responsibility than you would imagine to, uh, from the beginning. Uh, again, you need to make sure you keep things in control you, and not to make it a wild west. There's, there's oversight for everything. Yeah, and I, I like the idea because this is the challenge that a lot of buyers have is, whoo, this is happening. I, I don't, I can't see it. The, your solution, you, at least you can see it, even if it's after the fact, yeah. to be able to say, whoa, 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 uh, that was $50,000 for what? At least you can see it, yeah? Yeah, and again, you should you probably shouldn't get to the point where fifty thousand dollars were spent and you don't know what it's about. So you can make sure that you when someone spends fifty thousand dollars, you get an alert before and you need to click the approve button before they, they actually spend it. But you're right. First thing, and we all went through uh, a variety of management classes, it's like you need to see in order to be able to manage. The first thing, just make sure you can see what's happening. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So then then we've got a question. Go ahead. The visibility here is crucial. This is number one. And of course, the governance and the alerts that you're getting from the system that it will not be a well you know, if, if, if there's any Which leads to the next question. How do you track compliance to local legislations? So one of the things that we're doing, we support now 180 different countries, 80 different currencies uh, for freelancers. Uh, we support multiple uh, legal entities for the corporate. And for every country that we operate, uh, we work through third parties that actually verify compliance from a financial standpoint, um, a tax standpoint. Uh, some countries require um, an identification document uploaded, some countries don't. So we kind of apply to those levels of, of legislation. Uh, the legal uh, part is, uh, itself is actually you need a template that complies with uh, your legal entity where that resides. So you don't really need a new contract for every state where you're every kind of where you're running. Interesting. Thanks for the questions, by the way. And then last question, and then we'll wrap this up. Uh, what about integrating into uh, other applications to identify the org structure to gain approvals? Is that part of the strategy or does it not need to be? So um, what we've done in the system, um, and it, it takes, goes back to kind of how we structured the system. Um, one of the things that we found out was when you look at projects in organization that don't necessarily mimic the org structure, because if you are, you're now working on a new campaign, marketing campaign, or, or launching a new product, it crosses multiple different parts of the organization. So we, the, the system will allow flexibility to create an entity, what we call a workspace, where there's an admin assigned and they can pull in people from other departments and decide who they're giving the budget and that creates the approval chain. 
Um, so you can create actually multiple different approval chains by, uh, by different projects. Interesting. And then how is this funded typically? Uh, you know, when I first read the question, I could see it here on the right. I was like, how is this funded? Well, we're, v we're VC back, but I guess the one in the question. Yeah. Uh, does the solution integrate with... Uh, so um, I'm not sure I follow the funding question. Uh, so funded is, um, uh, you know, when you get... Pay for pay, so I'm, uh, I'm Amdocs. How do I pay for Stoke? Okay, so you get an invoice at the end of the month for all the services you consumed. Uh, you pay us, we distribute the funds. Again, 180 countries, 80 different currencies, seven different payment methods you shouldn't carry. You have one entity to pay. Um, so I hope that answered the question. Go ahead, Shafar. From a procurement point of view, this is a fantastic solution. Instead of, uh, that was one of the major challenges that we faced. You know, we, you need to have many, many transactions to many, many freelancers with small and different uh, 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 payment terms in, in, in very small scale. By doing, by engaging so, we aggregate all these invoices, those small transactions. We just uh, issue one PO to uh, to Stoke, and based on consumptions, this is where we get the invoices and get paid. So it's a it's a com accumulative invoice, speed up the process, seamless, and uh, works fantastic. Ah, yeah. Uh, I assume there's another there's a follow up question at least in people's mind. The invoice itself can be broken down by teams, workspaces, legal entities, talents, however you want the, the, that uh, for your internal reporting. As for the VMS questions, um, it really depends on what it is you want to do. So the system has built-in API, both for reporting and, and running actions. It depends on the flow you're looking to do. Uh, we have basic integration with some things, deeper integrations with other. It really depends on what the workflow. We don't have an intimate relationship with VMSs because most of them are working on a far slower cadence than what we think organizations uh, need to have. We had one conversation with a well-known um, VMS where they told us they, uh, a specific company told us they have 40,000 resumes on PDF and how can those be part of the system? We're like, you know, PDFs are not really the way we're, we're looking at that. <laughs> well, first, thank you both. This, I'm prepping for this and, and going through it today has been wonderful and eye-opening. I hope everyone enjoyed it. Um, thanks again, Stoke, uh, for, for sponsoring this. Uh, you're going to get the deck if you attended. There's some free resources here. Remember, we'll be in, at the Royal Lancaster in London for our large European Buyer Summit uh, May 9th through 10th. Uh, we'll be back in Dallas, yay Dallas, uh, in the fall for the big U.S. CWS conference, and the Giggy will follow right after that. Thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone. Thanks for your time, for all the attendees. Have a great rest of your day and stay in touch. See you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.